praise the Lord. Greetings to you all once again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Brother Clinton, and you're back on the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth. That's why I'm here, and I hope that's why you're here as well. I'd like to talk to you about something that I've spoken about on this channel before. It's been a couple of years, though, and I realize that although there are over 1,500 videos on this channel, there are not a lot of you who actually take the time to go back and look at the videos that, uh, or go through the videos that I've posted on this channel over the last several years. And there are a lot of you who don't really look at the videos on this channel until something comes up in your subscription feed, and I understand that. So that's why I'm here making this video again. I want to talk to you about Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It's something that I've talked about before, and it's something that I will talk about again. It is a, a particular passage of the scripture that is absolutely true, of course, because it's the Word of God, but it is misunderstood and misapplied and misused by over 99% of people that profess to be Christians, and I want to explain to you why. So if you have your Holy Bible, King James Version, let's open up to Romans chapter 10, and I want to share this passage with you. And I'm going to try to keep this as brief as possible. So in, that, in doing so, I'm going to probably go over some things very quickly. And if I do that, and I go over something really quickly that you don't really understand, please feel free to make a comment in the comment section and ask, and I'll be happy to either explain uh, what I was talking about or, get, or send you a link to a video where I explain in detail uh, exactly what I was talking about. Before we begin, I want to let you know that this is a Christian ministry. It's not a social network and it's not a Facebook page. And so if you've come here just because you want to find things wrong with what I say and, and, and blaspheme God and twist around the Word of God and come at me with theology and, and the doctrine of your past or your denomination or all that stuff and be rude and stuff like that, you're going to find that you're not going to have an audience here. Okay, I just want to let you know that right up front so that you can save yourself the time of typing up a comment that's never going to appear. All right, I'm not trying to be rude, but what I'm saying is if you, if you have a question regarding the Word of God that you would like to learn about the Word of God, I'm here to help you, verily and gladly. But if you're here just to cause trouble and cause confusion, I'm letting you know right now all the comments are subject to my approval and your comment is not even going to show up if that's what you're here for. Okay, and you're also not going to receive anything from this message if that's what you're here for. So I would counsel you to humble yourself before the Lord and to judge everything that is going to be said in this video according to the Word of God and not according to what you have previously believed. And if you will do that, then you will be blessed. Praise God. Let's begin. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says this, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Praise the Lord. This is the truth of the Word of God. And it is part of a sentence. It's, it doesn't begin at the beginning of the sentence. If you'll notice, um, verse 9 begins with the word that. And it's not the beginning of the sentence. The sentence begins in verse 6. And it is a teaching to the church of Jesus Christ concerning the difference between the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of faith. What is the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of faith? Well, there are two terms that are actually really simple. The righteousness of the law is a term that refers to the things that the people of Israel did under the time of the Old Testament in order to please God. That's the righteousness of the law. And the righteousness of faith is a term that refers to the things that we as Christians do under this time of the New Testament to please God, okay, to serve God. So the things that Israel did under the law to serve God were different than the things that Christians do under this New Testament to serve God. They're totally different. See, that's what Paul is teaching here. That's what this passage is all about. I want to bring a couple of things to your attention. First of all, Romans is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to the saints at Rome, to the church of Jesus Christ, to Christians who were living in Rome at the time. We can tell this by a couple of things. I mean, right here in chapter 10, the first word of chapter 10 is brethren. So we know that Paul is writing to the brethren, and we also know that he wasn't writing to Jews. Paul was a Jew, so some might say, well, he was writing to his brethren, the Jews. Well, that can't be the case, because if we read the first verse and the second verse, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. 
So it's obvious by those two sentences that when he said brethren, he wasn't speaking to Jews. He was speaking to Christians. He was speaking to Christians about the Jews, but he wasn't writing this letter to some Jews. He was writing this letter to Christians. And also we can see that evident by you know, the first chapter. And uh, I'm thinking it's in verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's obvious that he wasn't writing to sinners and he wasn't writing to Jews. He was writing to the saints. He was writing to Christians. Paul had not personally been there in Rome to preach the gospel to these people, these Christians, but he had heard of them and they had heard of him and so he wanted to write to them in order to expound the gospel to them that they had believed and obeyed. And so in chapter 10, and if you're interested in learning more about the book of Romans, there's a series on this channel, which is a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Romans. It's a playlist. And if you go to the, the, to the main channel page, just click below where it says the word prophet. That'll take you to the main channel page. And then you'll see where it says playlists. Just click on the playlists link and then scroll down until you see the book of Romans or the, the letter to the Romans verse by verse. And it'll, uh, I spent, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 hours uh, making those videos. And it was a great blessing for me to make them, to go through the book of Romans with you. And I've had many people write me and tell me that it was a great blessing for them to go through that study with me as well. So if you're interested in learning more about the whole book of Romans, that would be a great tool for you. And I'd be very blessed if you would join me in that study. Praise the Lord. Um, having said that, Romans is a letter by the Apostle Paul written to Christians that were at Rome. Okay, It wasn't written to sinners to, to preach the gospel to them so that they could be saved from their sins. It was written to a group of people that had already been saved from their sins. Okay, That's the first thing I want to point out to you. The second thing I want to point out to you is if you'll come with me to the book of Acts chapter 19, we will see one example in the Bible of how Paul, the Apostle of Christ, preached the gospel to sinners. Starting from the beginning of the chapter, it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Okay. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? This is what Paul the Apostle of Christ said to some disciples when he came across them. They were disciples of the Lord Jesus. But they had only heard the preaching of John about Jesus. They hadn't heard anything after that yet. And so Paul ran across them. He discovered that they were disciples. And what was the first thing he asked them? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior yet? No, of course he didn't ask them that. And the reason he didn't ask them that is because he'd never heard of that. Paul, the Apostle of Christ, never heard of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. None of the Apostles of Christ had ever heard of any such ridiculous thing. He said, <clears throat> pardon me, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And then he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism, John the Baptist. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And that's where these disciples were in their faith, in their walk with the Lord. That's where they had come. That's the point that they had come to. That's all they knew so, thus far. And so Paul realized that after having spoken to them for a minute. And, and verse 5 says, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. That was the beginning of the Ephesian church. When you read the letter to the Ephesians in the New Testament, that's the group of people that the, that the letter to the Ephesians was written to. These 12 men right here. And whatever others after them obeyed the same gospel. So this is the way that Paul, the apostle of Christ, preached the gospel to sinners. To people that hadn't been saved from their sins yet. He asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost? And when they answered that they had not received the Holy Ghost, that they didn't even know about the Holy Ghost, then he said unto them, Unto what were you baptized? Because if you haven't received the Holy Ghost, how were you baptized then? And when he found out that they weren't baptized according to the gospel of Christ, because they didn't know about the gospel of Christ yet, then he preached the gospel of Christ to them. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And 
he laid his hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. That was how Paul the Apostle of Christ preached the gospel. It's the same way that all the other apostles preached the gospel to Jew and Gentile alike. And so when we come back over here to Romans chapter 10, we see that Paul is writing a letter to the saints at Rome. And in the beginning of the chapter, he begins by saying, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Amen? Notice he didn't say Christ is the end of the law, period, because Christ didn't come to do away with the law. He said Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And so now he's going to explain to us the difference between the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of faith. The righteousness of the law, remember, is a term that means the things that the people of Israel did under the law to be righteous before God. And the righteousness of faith is a term that refers to the things that Christians do under this time of the New Testament to be righteous before God. That's what this teaching is about. Verse 5, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Okay, this is a quote from the law. Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. <clears throat> But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Okay, now Paul is beginning to quote from the book of Deuteronomy in the 30th chapter, verses 11 through 14. Pardon me. <coughs> um, in, in the book of De Deuteronomy, <coughs> pardon me, in the book of Deuteronomy, verses 11, 30, I do speak English, let me start over. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 11 through 14, God was speaking through his servant Moses to the people of Israel. And he was basically saying, you all cannot say that, you know, who's going to go up to heaven and, and get the law for us, or who's going to dig down into the depths of the earth and bring it up for us again so that we can hear it and do it. Because I already put it in your hearts. God said this to the people of Israel. I spoke the word to you. My word is not going to return to me void. It has gone forth. It is in your hearts. So you have no excuse. You can't say, I don't have it. You can't say, who's going to go get it for me? It is already in your hearts to do it. That's what God said through the people, through Moses to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14. And Paul is quoting from that passage right here and using it to apply to the New Testament as well. Just as Israel had things that they needed to do to please God during the time of the Old Testament, so it is that we who are Christians have things that we need to do in order to please God during this time of the New Testament. When I say we who are Christians, I'm talking about people who have turned from our sins and been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and been filled with the Holy Ghost, which will cause you to speak with other tongues and prophesy. The same gospel that we just heard Paul preach to the, to the disciples at Ephesus. That's how people become Christians. So those of us who are Christians, we have something that we need to do to be righteous before God as well. So Paul is using that, that passage from Deuteronomy chapter 30 where God spoke to the people of Israel saying, you have no excuse because my word is in you. I put it in you. So you can't say who's going to go bring it to us. It's already in you. Paul's using that same precept, transferring it to the New Testament and talking to us as Christians about something that we need to do in order to be righteous before God. And this is what he says. But the righteousness which is of faith, verse 6, I'm in Romans 10, verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart. And by the way, this is where the sentence begins. The sentence doesn't begin in verse 9. It begins right here in verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Okay, You can't say in your heart, who's going to bring Christ down for us again? You've already obeyed the gospel of Christ. The word is already in you. Or, who shall descend into the deep that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? Okay. You can't say that. You who are a Christian, the word is already in you. You already know that Christ is risen from the dead. That's why you were baptized in his name. Verse 8, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith, 
which we preach, which we preach. This is the key to understanding the passage. Well, one of the keys, anyway, to understanding the passage. Uh, another one of the keys is understanding who this pass who this letter was written to. It was written to Christians, not to sinners. And another key to the passage is to understanding this passage is to understand that Paul, the apostle of Christ, preached the same gospel as the other apostles, which is repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. As Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And to be born of water and of the Spirit is to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which will cause you to speak with other tongues and prophesy. That's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul says here in verse 8, but what saith it? What does it mean? What, what saith it? The righteousness which is of faith saith it. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is instruction to Christians that lets us know that if we want to be saved from the wrath that is to come, then there's something that we need to do. Number one, we need to confess the Lord Jesus Christ with our mouth so that others can hear about him. This means preaching the gospel. This means go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus said, if ye confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. But if ye deny me before men, I will also deny you before my Father. See? So when Paul said, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that had absolutely nothing to do with the pretend tradition that has been injected into the churches by the Jesuits today of getting on your knees and accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and saying in a church meeting, I confess the Lord Jesus with my mouth and I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. That is a vain ritual that has absolutely nothing to do with anything that is written in the Scripture. It has nothing to do with the Gospel of Christ and it won't make you a Christian and it won't get your sins forgiven. All that it will do for you is cause you to falsely think that you've been saved from your sins when you haven't. Because there is no such thing as accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The apostles of Jesus Christ never heard of that. And that has absolutely nothing to do with Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 is, the passage, is a passage out of the middle of a sentence that was written to the church of Jesus Christ, baptized in his name, filled with his spirit, and it is concerning, it is a teaching concerning the difference between the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of faith. It's a teaching concerning the difference between the things that Israel did under the Old Testament to be righteous before God and the things that Christians do during this time of the New Testament to be righteous before God. And two of those things are, number one, confessing with our mouth the Lord Jesus so that other people can hear about him and, and be saved and call upon his name. And two, to continue in the faith of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is a teaching to Christians. If you're not a Christian, this doesn't apply to you. If you haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and received the Holy Ghost, then this doesn't apply to you. This is a teaching that is for Christians to show us what it is now that we've been saved from our sins, we need to do something in order to be saved from the wrath of God which is coming. And you might say, Brother Clinton, that's heresy. I'm saved and I can never be unsaved and I'm saved forever. And, you know, unconditional, you know, uh, whatever it is, you know, uh, uh, how do they say it? Eternal security. Well, that's a lie. That's garbage. Okay. If you just turn back to Romans chapter 5, I want to share with you two verses of the scripture, verses 9 and 10. Romans chapter 5, verses 9 and 10 says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Whoa, that's something that maybe a lot of you never even paid attention to before. Wait a second. Much more than being now justified by his blood. If you're a Christian, if you've been born of water and of the Spirit, baptized in his name, filled with his Spirit, then you are now justified by his blood. It says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved 
in the future shall be is a future tense term we shall be saved from wrath through him okay the fact that you may be saved right now from your sins is, is a wonderful thing but it doesn't mean that you're automatically saved from the wrath that is coming when God comes in Christ to bring wrath upon sinners and establish his kingdom in the earth you're not going to be saved from that wrath unless you first have been saved from your sins and secondly abide in the light keeping the commandments of God keeping yourself holy and doing these things that Paul commanded us to do this is the righteousness of faith confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead you see let's read verse 10 as well Romans chapter 5 verse 10 but because it says the same thing all over again for if when we were enemies that's in time past right when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son that's in time past okay those of us who are Christians we were reconciled to God by the death of his son Jesus Christ that happened in the past when we obeyed his gospel much more being reconciled being reconciled that's present tense Okay, we are now reconciled to God, those of us who are Christians. We shall be saved by his life. Shall be. That's the future tense. Okay, there can be no mistaking it. That's future tense. So, those of us who are Christians, we have been saved by the gospel of Christ from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear son, Jesus Christ, so that we can walk seeing his kingdom and operating in, in the precepts of his kingdom in this world. And if we do that which is pleasing in the sight of God, and if we keep ourselves unspotted from the world, then we shall be saved from the wrath that is coming upon the people of this world when Jesus Christ comes back to take his throne in Jerusalem. That's what the scripture says. So there is no once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved is a doctrine of devils. It has nothing to do with the scripture at all. It is people misunderstanding two or three verses of the scripture and then ignoring other verses of the scripture so that they can stand in their once saved, always saved doctrine. It's a ridiculous heresy and, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the truth. So back to Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Who is thou referring to? Thou is a, is a singular uh, second person personal pronoun it means I am talking to you thou okay well I say you in, in English when I'm talking to you but that's actually the common vernacular you when I'm talking to one person you is actually incorrect you is a plural second person personal pronoun when I say you the correct word the correct use of the word you is if I'm talking to more than one person if I'm talking to one person then I would use the correct uh, personal pronouns thee or thou or thy whatever you know the, the tense may whatever the case is whatever is what that we're talking about so thou is a second person singular personal pronoun Paul is talking to the church as if the church were one person okay and he's talking to the church he's not talking to sinners all over the world he didn't say you or ye he said thou he was talking to the church the church as a one entity, the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that is how we preach the gospel, preaching the gospel to other people. We already are Christians. We already are saved from the power of darkness. Now this is our righteousness before God, that we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus so that other people can believe on him and call upon his name. And we continue in the faith of his resurrection. If you've ever read 1 Corinthians, you know that the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, which is the longest chapter in the whole letter, is dedicated to the, to the concept that there were certain in the church at Corinth that were saying that the resurrection was past already, that there was no more resurrection. And Paul marveled at that, and he was like, are you guys serious? Yeah. Is there really some among you that are saying that there is no more resurrection? Well, if there's no more resurrection, if there is no resurrection, then Christ is not risen from the dead. And if Christ isn't risen from the dead, then why in the world were you baptized in his name? And he spent the whole 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians teaching the people at the church at Corinth that if they were, if anyone was, would be able to convince them of the lie that there was no more resurrection, 
that they would not enter into the kingdom of God. Because how are you going to be raised from the dead after you die if you stop believing that there is even a resurrection? You and I, we're Christians, we began this walk because we believed that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. If we didn't believe that he was risen from the dead, why in the world would we have been baptized in his name? Baptized into the name of a dead guy? That doesn't make any sense at all. We were baptized into the name of the living Son of God. He was crucified for the sins of the world, the just for the unjust, and he has risen from the dead. He got up out of his grave on the third day, and he ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the majesty on high. And that's why we were baptized in his name, because he's alive, because he's risen from the dead. And if we stop believing, let me just back up a little bit. We believe we were baptized in his name because he is risen from the dead. And because he is risen from the dead, if we continue in the faith of the resurrection, then when we, when the time comes that this mortal body dies, we shall be risen as well with him because of the spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwell in us. He is able to quicken our mortal bodies by that same spirit. And so Jesus said, He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Death has been overcome. Hell and the grave have been overcome by our Lord Jesus Christ. He is alive. He's risen from the dead. That's why we were baptized in his name. And if we continue in the faith of his resurrection, then we shall be resurrected in the last day. And this is why Jesus, this is why John wrote in 1 John, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Beloved, what, what manner of, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. 1 John 3. Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man, every man that hath this hope in him keepeth himself pure, even as he is pure. This is what Paul was saying in Romans 10.9. That if we continue in the faith of the resurrection, continue to believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, not let anybody dissuade us from the truth of the matter that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, then we also shall attain to the resurrection. But if we stop, if we allow someone to, to, to convince us that there is no more resurrection, then guess what? We're not going to be risen from the dead. We're not going to be resurrected if we stop believing in the resurrection. That's kind of obvious. And so Paul said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou, Christian, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Hallelujah. Now let's go on. Because that, the, 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 the teaching doesn't end there. Verse 11, For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Praise the Lord. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? And how do we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved? Well, Paul the Apostle of Christ preached, repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. He preached that because all the other apostles preached it and they all got it from the same person, Jesus Christ. And Paul, the apostle of Christ, how was he saved? Was he saved just by believing in nothing else? No, of course not. Jesus Christ, the Lord, sent a man to him whose name was Ananias. And Ananias, and you can read about this in the book of Acts in the ninth chapter and also in the 22nd chapter, Ananias came unto him and laid his hands upon him to heal him because he was blinded for three days, Paul was, because of the glory of the Lord. But after Ananias had laid his hands upon him, he was healed. The scales fell from his eyes and he wasn't blind anymore. And he certainly didn't have any infirmity in his eyes um, any time after that, contrary to what theologians will tell you. But Ananias came to him and laid his hands upon him, and his eyes were healed, and he received the Holy Ghost. And Ananias said unto him, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22.16 Check it out for yourself. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 
whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. How do we call upon the name of the Lord? We don't call upon the name of the Lord by the, the invented doctrines of men going to a church meeting and, and saying, I, I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. That's not how we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. The way we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved is the way the Bible says to call upon the name of the Lord. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's how we call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's go on, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are people going to call on the name of the Lord if they haven't believed on the Lord? And how shall they believe on him, pardon me, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How are people going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ if they've never heard of him? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? This is what, for, this is what Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 is all about. My friends and brethren, this is what it's all about. It has absolutely nothing to do with the vain ritual invented by men of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with sinners becoming Christians. It has to do with the responsibility that is given to Christians to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and to continue in the faith of his resurrection. And if we as Christians do that, then we shall be saved from the wrath that is coming in the future when God comes in Christ again, to take the throne in Jerusalem, the throne of David that was his from the beginning. That's what this passage is all about. Praise the Lord. So you see, Paul didn't preach two different Gospels. And there is no such thing as accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And there's nowhere in the entire book of Romans where Paul ever preached the Gospel of salvation to a sinner. Ever. In fact, all of the epistles from Romans all the way to Jude are just that. They're epistles. They're royal letters that were written from the apostles and elders to the churches. Not one of them is written to a sinner. If you want to find out how sinners heard the gospel of Jesus Christ from the apostles and they obeyed the gospel and became Christians, then you look in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. That's where you find it. And now some of you are saying, well, Brother Clinton, now you're exalting the book of Acts over other books of the Bible. No, I'm certainly not. I'm just rightly dividing the scripture. It's like I've said many times, if you want to, you know, you can read about the Ten Commandments in many, ver in many books of the Bible. You can read about the Ten Commandments in the Psalms. It's mentioned in the Prophets. It's mentioned in the, in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But there, there's only one place in the Bible that you can go if you want a historical account of what happened on the day that God gave those Ten Commandments to His people Israel. The book of Exodus, chapter 20. Okay, Am I exalting the book of Exodus above every other book of the Bible? Because I say that you have to go to the book of Exodus if you want to read about how the Ten Commandments were given to the people of Israel? No, I'm just rightly dividing the Scripture. That's where it is. Okay, So the book of Acts isn't more important than any other book of the Bible. But it is the only book in the Bible where you will find historical accounts of Christian ministers, the apostles of Jesus Christ and, and elders and evangelists, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that needed to be saved from their sins and how they heard the gospel and obeyed it and became Christians and churches were formed. The only place in the whole Bible that you're going to find a historical account of those things happening is in the book of Acts. Okay, It's not more important than any other book of the Bible. It's just that that's where you're going to find it. And you will find the gospel of Jesus Christ referred to in the epistles from Romans to Jude many times. But Romans to Jude, the epistles, they're not written to sinners. And there's nowhere in any of the epistles from Romans to Jude where anybody was ever preaching the gospel to a sinner so that he could be saved from his sins. Those are letters that are written to Christians. And that's part of how we rightly divide the word of truth. See, So if you want to find out how the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached and people obeyed it and became Christians, then you go to the book of Acts and you'll see it many times there. I found at least 10 instances in the book of Acts which give us a detailed description of how the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached and people obeyed it and became Christians. And no apostle of Jesus Christ ever 
ever told anybody that if they would accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that they would be saved. So why do professional pastors teach that in churches all over the world today? And why do people walk around with Bibles under their arms, professing to be Christians and speaking the name of Jesus and healing people in Jesus' name and casting out devils in Jesus' name and boldly speaking the name of Jesus, but they're not baptized in the name of Jesus? Why? Why do they think that they became Christians by accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? They have a Bible under their hand, under their arms. But there's nothing in that Bible that says anything about accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Not one single word. The apostles of Jesus Christ never heard of that. They, are you listening? They never heard of that. Paul, Peter, Barnabas, uh, Philip, they, uh, all the apostles of Jesus Christ, they never heard of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. There is no such thing as saying a sinner's prayer to be saved from your sins. There is no such thing. Search the scriptures. You won't find it. But you will find, if you search the scriptures, that the apostles of Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, went forth preaching the gospel to every creature as Jesus commanded. And from the day that the New Testament began, 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel that he gave to his holy apostles began to be preached, and it is the same today as it was then. If you desire to be saved from your sins, here is the way. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And many of you are saying, Brother Clinton, you said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Yes, that's what the Bible says. But why do people stop there? Come with me to Acts chapter 16 real quick. Why do people stop in the middle of a paragraph, in the middle of a story, and pretend that it's the end of the story, and then make up a, a gospel that doesn't exist. Acts chapter 16, verse 29. We know what's happening here, that Paul and Silas were in Philippi, and they uh, were preaching the gospel. They were arrested and cast into the lower part of the prison. They were praising God. There was an earthquake, and everybody's chains and bars broke loose, and all the prisoners were, were set free. And in verse 29 it says, Then he called for a light, the, the jailer called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And then many people just stopped there, and imagined that all that they had to do was just believe, and that they would be saved, and, and instantly all their family members would be saved too. Well, that's kind of ridiculous. The Bible doesn't say that. Let's continue reading. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. What's the word of the Lord? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. They spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And what happened after they spake the word of the Lord to him and all that were in his house? They believed the word of the Lord, and they were baptized. Isn't that interesting? Because Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. That's the rest of the story. So, you know, why do people ignore the rest of the story and just stop in the middle and pretend that's the end? Well, pretty much they, they do that because they don't want to know the truth and they want to continue to cleave to the lies that have been thrown to them from the pulpits in their denominational churches. But you see, Romans 10, 9 and 10 doesn't have anything to do with that vain ritual of, of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And that's the, that's the verse of the Scripture. That's the, passage, that's the passage of the Scripture that all these people that believe in that lying gospel that doesn't exist, that is no gospel, all the people that believe in that false gospel of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, saying a sinner's prayer to become a Christian, all the people that believe in that will come to me with Romans 10, 9, and 10 to try to prove to me that that doctrine is true. But Romans 10, 9, and 10 has absolutely nothing to do with any such thing. It is a teaching to Christians about the difference between the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of faith. It is a teaching to Christians to show us that it is our responsibility before the living God to preach the gospel, to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and to continue in the faith of his resurrection so that we also may attain unto the resurrection. 
And if we do those things, then we shall be saved. We who are Christians shall be saved. Because how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? It's perfectly plain. It's perfectly plain, and it has been hidden in broad daylight from so many by the witchcraft that has been brought forth through the Jesuits into the denominations, teaching people lies before they're even familiar with any of the Scripture to cause them to misunderstand the Scripture before they even read it. But Romans 10, 9, and 10 has absolutely nothing to do with that. It has absolutely nothing to do with, Christ with sinners becoming Christians. It has absolutely nothing to do with a sinner becoming a Christian, being saved from his sins. <clears throat> has nothing to do with that at all. <clears throat> Pardon me, and it doesn't say anything about that. So may this message be a blessing to those of you who love the Word of God. And again, I'm here for you if you have earnest questions. I really am, and I totally understand how you have been deceived all, the, all these years in thinking that this passage of the Scripture was about something that it's not about at all. I totally understand that because I was there. I was there. But when God showed me His Gospel, the Gospel of the New Testament, then I went to Him and I said, I went to Him. Notice I said that. I went to Him. God. And I said, God, if that's the gospel of the New Testament, that's the way people are saved, then what about Romans 10, 9, and 10? And I must have struggled with it for a couple of weeks. I kept reading it over and over and over. And I'm like, if it doesn't mean what I think it means, then what does it mean? If it doesn't mean what I've been taught that it means, what does it mean? And God revealed it to me. It took a couple of weeks, but God revealed it to me. And he'll reveal it to you if you seek him diligently with all your heart. Hopefully it's been revealed to you through this very message, because hopefully you began listening to this message with a desire in your heart to learn the truth of the Word of God. And if that's the case, then you've been able to see. Praise the Lord. So again, if you have earnest questions, I'm here for you. Please don't try to use the comment forum for arguments and, and theology and all that nonsense. But um, if you have earnest questions and you desire to be edified by the Word of God, I'm here for you to serve you in our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Clinton. I'm your servant in the service of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh,